Recording in progress. Hello, everybody. Everybody's being admitted to the uh, meeting. Looks like we'll have about 33 people once Denny uh, joins the meeting. There we go. Okay, um, it looks like we got uh, 33 people here. Uh, there will be a... Uh, um, business meeting that will last about 15 minutes at the beginning, uh, and then we'll get into the uh, presentation and stuff. At this point, uh, kicking off the meeting, I'd like to welcome everyone to the November 22 meeting of the World's Fair Society. I think most of you know I'm Mike Trax. I've either talked with you or I've been uh, saying this for a few years on Zoom. This year is the 118th anniversary of the opening of the fair and the 36th anniversary of our society. Tonight, we're going to view a new historical look at some unusual and beautiful statues that were displayed at the fair. These casts were made in Germany by August Gerber, and we'll hear a lot about him. Uh, first of all, I hope that there's a few non-World's Fair Society members here today. Uh, I hope so. I know there's one I talked with this afternoon. I'm not sure if she uh, joined in uh, remotely or how. But I talked with uh, a Marsha who lives out in Baldwin, but she's out in California right now, and she heard the Johnny Rabbit show yesterday. If you haven't had a chance to uh, hear that, there's a link on our Facebook page to hear it. Uh, you have to go forward about 20 minutes, and you can hear uh, uh, Johnny Rabbit, otherwise known as Ron Ells, uh, ask me some questions, and uh, I think we had a nice little conversation about it. You can find out more about the Society for everyone uh, with our almost 300 members at our website or our Facebook page or Instagram. I have a few administrative reminders and announcements to everyone. Uh, unless you're an administrator uh, or a co-host, please make sure that you're muted unless you need to unmute for a specific reason. Uh, and there may be an opportunity for that uh, before and we'll let people chat a little bit afterwards. Uh, for members, today is the last day to order Metal Society name tags through Doug Stone. Doug has uh, taken the lead and sent all Society members an opportunity to order the Metal Society name tags. And if you want to see what they look like, there's one right there. How about that? Um, Another reminder about the uh, History Museum, the current World's Fair exhibit will be taken down in early 2023 so that a new exhibit can be built. Uh, so hope you get to see it again uh, before March or so when it's gone. Also want to remind people about the banquet. Your last two bulletins contained one of these, a reservation form for our banquet. Those are due by November 21st on Monday. Our banquet will be at the Probstein Golf Course uh, in Forest Park, Saturday, December 3rd at 1230. There'll be a buffet dinner with uh, chicken piccata and top round of beef, a couple sides. There'll be a salad and uh, a dessert table and stuff. Uh, we'll have a great time with the Gateway Harmonica Club for entertainment. I'll do a uh, short year in review. We'll have attendance prizes uh, for everybody and an attendee gift for everyone. And there will also be a special piece of memorabilia from the 1904 World's Fair that Bob Herman has donated to the society. It's a book larger than a family Bible and it weighs about 12 pounds. And it's one of the Missouri books that people going to the fair would sign in the Missouri building. And Bob has used it through the years, bringing it to banquets and occasional meetings for all the attendees to sign and for various officers to sign. So we'll have an officer page there, and we're going to ask all attendees at the banquet to uh, sign that book uh, for the first time as it moves on. I think most of you know who Bob Herman is, a charter member with Bob and Bobby. They're on here somewhere. Uh, give us a wave. I can't see you on my screen, but I imagine you're online somewhere. Bob, my video. 
um, and they are going to be moving from Jefferson City over to Kansas City to be closer to their son over there. Uh, and finally, the annual elections for the society officers is going to be held right now as required in our bylaws. You probably read in the emails and uh, the bulletin that we're looking for volunteers to fill two key society positions, including an elected officer. We need a staff of good involved people to help run the society and to maintain our high quality member experience, which uh, this will hopefully be another one. So the chairperson of the uh, election committee is Mary Ellen Dick, our vice president. Mary Ellen, uh, are you ready to go ahead? I am. Can okay, go ahead. All right. So tonight uh, we have election for three officers who uh, will appoint the four directors who aid them in uh, all the planning and operation of the society. The officers who are uh, you will be voting on are Mike Truax, President, Mary Ellen Dick, Vice President, and David Meyer, Secretary. Uh, let's see here. So we will need someone uh, if there are any uh, other names to be suggested for these positions from the uh, membership, please uh, unmute yourself and share those with us tonight. Okay, Mary I don't Ellen, believe there are any more. Yes. Mary Ellen, I just wanted to yes. say I, uh, there is a possibility that I found somebody who might take the treasurer position, but we want to discuss Excellent. this as a board before we bring that name forward. Thank you for sharing that tonight, Linda. That is uh, good news for all of us to know. So thank you. Um, so we'll have more information at another meeting then or a future meeting. Or the okay, banquet. So if, or the banquet. Yes, well, that would be our next meeting, wouldn't it? So um, <clears throat> you've heard the uh, slate of officers. So we can begin the voting uh, with a motion from the floor and a second to put those three off those three offices forward for voting. So do I hear a motion? Make for... a motion that we vote on those candidates. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. All right. So if you are in favor of the three candidates who were just named, just say aye. 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 aye, aye. You have to unmute, unmute yourselves. Unmute yourselves. Aye. All right. Any nays? Oh, we're still getting eyes. Any nays? No? All right, so it's unanimous that the officers will be returning for the 2023 uh, year. And as soon as we know something about uh, possible treasure, uh, as Linda said, then uh, we'll be sharing that with the membership. Okay, I just want to reiter reiterate about uh, Dan and our need for a volunteer to fill that position. Um, Dan has had to step aside as treasurer due to his responsibilities at Bellefontaine Cemetery. Uh, over the seven years he has been treasurer, he has organized the books using Quicken, and he has said he would assist anyone who uh, wishes to become treasurer uh, with learning Quicken if they are not already familiar with it. So uh, please consider volunteering if you are a person who is good with numbers or know someone who might be interested in uh, serving in this position in our society. Uh, you could contact any board member if you have uh, yourself, you want to nominate yourself or uh, have information about someone who might be interested. So I would hope to hear from Linda further and uh, maybe anyone else if they are also interested in the treasurer's position. Uh, there's also the position as uh, event chairman. And um, I think Mike spoke about that. He, he needs help because he is serving as president and the events chairman and uh, both positions are full-time positions and he's needing some help there. 
All right, so we have completed the, uh, the election and the officers from 2022 are continuing in their posts with the exception of Dan in 2023. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mary Ellen. Uh, we're we're through the elections, and I just want to say that it's you know Dan wrote a nice end of tour report covering uh, the past <laughs> nine years that he's been treasurer that was in the last bulletin, uh, and with his uh, duties at work increasing, uh, it's time for him to pass the checkbook to another society member. And I think we're all aware of that. And uh, I just found out before the meeting what Linda was referring to, and our board will be uh, getting together to discuss and, uh, you know, work that and we'll uh, keep you all posted. Uh, as far as program director goes, we may have a volunteer to start helping out and uh, get into that next year. And uh, we'll see how that goes. So if you do have any questions or if you would like to help the society out in any function, as Mary Ellen said, please contact any board member. So next, I'd like to uh, start getting ready for the presentation and set the stage for this presentation with a look back at what happened 118 years ago today. Tuesday, November 8th, 1904, the fair had just had a few weeks to go before it would close forever. The weather was changing, visitors were crowding the fair to take maybe their final look at the palaces and the exhibits. And guess what? 118 years ago, it was election day in 1904. <laughs> the elections dominated the news and conversations at the fair. In honor of election day, the LPE company declared a special flag day at the fair. The largest flag ever made, 60 feet by 100 feet, was unfurled over the plaza of St. Louis on a wire stretched between the Palace of Manufacturers and varied industries. Daytime fireworks bombs would occasionally fill the air with little tiny flags that would float down to the ground as souvenirs. I've never seen one of those, but I've heard about it. There was a mock vote of the Philippine natives. President Roosevelt scored a huge win over his opponent, Judge Alton Parker. The Igorot vote was unanimous for the president, and the final vote was 83 to 2. While Chief Antonio of the Igorotes worked hard to try to get a unanimous vote, some Americans persuaded one Suyok Igorot and one Tinguain to vote for Parker. Now, in the afternoon and evening, the election returns were coming into the Missouri building by telegraph. They were passed to visitors on the pike by some stereopticon lanterns that were shining on various walls kind of like a slide projector. Roosevelt carried Missouri by 20,000 votes, and he was the first Republican to carry the state in over 30 years. He also mm -hmm. carried St. Louis, despite, quote, some glaring fraud in the Democratic wards by Alderman Snake Kinney's henchmen. Well, let's just hope we don't have any of that uh, kind of uh, stuff going on today, and I don't want to get into politics too much, so we'll uh, move on from politics, whether it's 1904 or 2022. I want to introduce our speaker, Mr. Frank Nickel. He is the historical director for the Kellerman Foundation for Historical Preservation in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. He is a prof was a professor of history at Southeast Missouri State University in Cape Girardeau for over 44 years. He has also worked for the State Historical Society of Missouri. And in assembling his presentation, I want to give a tip of the hat and a thank you to his friends, Tom Newmeyer and Denise McAllister, who uh, I've been Zooming with, uh, oh, every day for a little bit uh, in the last little while to make it work. So I'm going to be quiet, and Denise, you can uh, take control, I guess, with your computer and begin screen sharing with the presentation. And I think we got the uh, audio worked out now so that uh, Frank can give his presentation. Hopefully everyone can see the uh, uh, large screen of the statuary at the 1904 World's Fair. If you can't see that now, unmute yourself and say, I can't see it now. Okay, I guess we're good. Uh, Denise and Frank, uh, on to you. 
Thank you very much and uh, hello to everyone there. I appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you this evening. I was a historian at Southeast uh, for a long time. I went to oh, Southeast man. Missouri State University in 1969, a long time ago, on a one-year appointment. That was 54 years ago. Uh, and so I've been around St. Louis, I've been around Cape Girardeau for a very long time. Uh, and in that time, I did a lot of different kinds of things. One of the things I did, I never really thought about it until I talked to uh, Tom Newmeyer, uh, was uh, take care of or be a caretaker of the uh, Hauk statuary from the World's Fair uh, in uh, 1904. Uh, and then I discovered that um, a person who played a key role in that was a gentleman uh, uh, from uh, Cape Girardeau. And I'll talk about him in just uh, a moment. Uh, but I am honored to be able to talk to Mike's group and to all of you in the uh, what do you call it? The uh, 1904 World's Fair Society. Zoom land. Okay, Zoom, Zoom land. land. That's good. Oh, uh, and uh, let's turn to the first uh, image, uh, Denise. Uh, we want to talk about uh, Cape Girardeau in southeast Missouri, which is uh, stuck down here in the boot heel. And most people in uh, Jefferson City never think about this area. Uh, so we have to uh, sometimes be a little noisy uh, to get attention. Uh, but Southeast Missouri is a very large area and a very rural area. Cape Girardeau and Southeast Missouri to Bethany, where I have a friend, in Northeast Missouri is approximately the same distance as from St. Louis to Pittsburgh. So Missouri is a big state. From Cape Girardeau to Kennett, both in Southeast Missouri, it's 100 miles. And seven counties in Missouri's Boot Hill produce the equivalent of Missouri's total agricultural income annually. This is a rich land, all of the topsoil of the upper Midwest brought here free of charge and used by the farmers to produce some of the best uh, uh, crops and grains uh, in the world. And Southeast Missouri was, of course, late to become a frontier. Thus, it was late to move out of the frontier status. And during the Civil War, virtually all public education in the state of Missouri stopped. Uh, many of the teachers left the state. Uh, many of them settled in the upper Midwest. Consequently, following the war, there were many efforts, uh, many frustrated efforts by people uh, to increase teacher numbers, uh, to get some teachers to come back into Missouri, especially uh, uh, when after they had settled in the upper Midwest. In Missouri and Illinois, that effort to increase the number of available teachers for the children of uh, Missouri uh, focused upon the normal school movement. Normal schools, as most of you know, uh, is the term given to teacher training institutions. Uh, and uh, the normal school movement at the very time uh, that uh, during Reconstruction, uh, that uh, people were trying to rejuvenate the education system in the state. Uh, contributed much to what happened in Missouri. It led to uh, Northeast, Southwest, Northwest, and Central uh, uh, Missouri State Universities, copying the Illinois example. Illinois was first to uh, sort of motivate uh, uh, young men and women to go into education. Uh, and the normal school movement in uh, uh, Illinois ended up with uh, uh, five schools, uh, Northern, Southern, Eastern, Western, and Normal. Uh, and uh, Normal was built out at the countryside and 
uh, and it became a, a, a large university. And so today, there's a town that's growing around a uh, normal state oh, university, normal. Uh, normal Illinois State University, uh, which uh, is a, a, a large town. But the college started the town. Uh, competition uh, among the uh, local communities for securing a regional college was serious. Southeast Missouri State University was founded in Cape Girardeau in 1873. Uh, and there was almost uh, violence between uh, various towns fighting over control of uh, the new, newly developed uh, college. Uh, local businessmen contested for securing a college and all that goes with it. And by the narrowest of margins, on December 1, 1873, the third district normal school was founded in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Today it's Southeast Missouri State University. Uh, and uh, founded in 1873 will be approaching its 100th anniversary this coming spring. And we're already planning a different variety of uh, activities to celebrate that 100 years. Uh, and one of the th first buildings uh, ever built in Cape Girardeau uh, for education was Academic Hall. I think you see that on the screen now. It was erected in 1875 for the new Southeast Normal School in Cape Girardeau or the third district normal school. Number one was uh, uh, in uh, 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 Warrensburg. Uh, and the new Southeast Normal School in Cape Girardeau uh, was built in 1875 and from 1873, 1874 and 75, uh, the college existed by sharing classrooms in some elementary schools and some churches. Uh, Academic Hall uh, was eventually built uh, after the this building that you see on the screen burned on April 7, 1901. Uh, uh, this building had been put up by $19,000, total cost of the building. It's hard to believe when you look at it now, uh, but it was the whole college in one building. Uh, and uh, they believe that some soiled rags uh, soaked in oil uh, may have just internally combusted and as a result uh, uh, burned the building down. Uh, they sought to uh, uh, try and uh, uh, rebuild on the foundation, but it simply was too fragile. They could not do it. So they had to build a brand new uh, building. Uh, and uh, uh, this building was gone. Uh, and as a result, uh, they organized the uh, uh, normal school by picking an administrator. They wanted to get the best administrator they could get. Uh, and they got a fellow from uh, uh, Illinois, uh, originally from Virginia. Uh, and uh, that was uh, Lucas Cheney. So here's Mr. Cheney. Uh, he spelled it the same way our recent vice president spelled his name, but he pronounced it Cheney. Uh, and uh, it was Cheney. But Lu Lucius Cheney was the first president. They called him principal at the time. A Southeast Missouri Normal School. Highly qualified. He had taught up in Joliet, Illinois. He taught in a normal school in Massachusetts. He taught in a normal school in Illinois. Uh, and uh, he was highly qualified to serve in this capacity. Uh, Shaney was a, a bright and capable person, highly experienced. Uh, unfortunately, he only lasted as president for two years because he was, of all things, an archeologist. Uh, I can't imagine an archeologist as a university president today, uh, but Cheney was. Uh, and uh, he went to a field school in Tennessee 
1876. Uh, and while he was there, uh, all of the archaeologists dug down, worked on uh, uh, the little piece of property that they were exploring. And Shady found the uh, false skeleton uh, and uh, thought that uh, the soil was such that he could probably get all of the soil out uh, uh, and he could remove the whole skeleton. So he got down in the grave site, worked on it, and while he was down there, it was very narrow. He had to work intensely, uh, and he was uh, working apart from some of the others for a while. And while he was down in the bottom of uh, uh, his burial, it caved in on him uh, and uh, suffocated him. Uh, he died there. Uh, and uh, uh, it certainly set the college back. It caused uh, almost a closer, closure of the college. Uh, but he was buried back in Cape Girardeau. He is now, his gravestone is a fixture in Old Lorimer Cemetery in Cape Girardeau. Uh, he's supposed to be a distant relative of our recent vice president, same family, both came from the same area. Of Virginia. But Cheney was the first president, only lasted two years. Take a look at what happens after this in 19, uh, all the way up to 1902. Uh, we had uh, uh, Duncan Vandiver, president of Southeast Missouri State Normal School from 1993 to 95. Uh, we got individuals. Uh, Political uh, and uh, wanted to be president of the uh, university of the college of normals. He copied Mark Twain a bit, uh, dressed like him, had a mustache like him, and tried to be a comedian. Uh, and uh, a lot of politicians tried to do that. Uh, he, of course, is the guy. Uh, said uh, he was in the U.S. House of Representatives. He was accused by the Board of Regents uh, of being too political and proved that by running for Congress, getting elected. Uh, but Vandiver is the guy who said, I'm from Missouri, you've got to show me. Uh, and he said, from the elephants doesn't affect me. Said it's uh, he's in Missouri, in Missouri, raised corn and cotton and cockleburrs and Democrats. And he said, uh, uh, I don't want to be uh, a traditional politician. Uh, and he was one who wanted to keep the cost low for students. So tuition was free, incidental fees were $3 per semester. So you could go to college for a tuition fee of just three dollars. Uh, Vandiver, uh, uh, accused of being political, ran for Congress and was elected. Uh, and all these things thought to be tradition. Found the letter uh, just last year, but he wrote in nineteen or in eighteen ninety six. Uh, and in that, he wrote to uh, uh, our uh, uh, Board of Regents president, who had become enamored of Mr. Vandiver. And the Board of Regents president said, uh, uh, Mr. Vandiver, uh, we would like for you to not run for political office. We'd like for you to stay here. And manage the college. And Vandiver said, uh, I don't think I can do that. I think I have to run, see if I'm elected. And if, if I'm elected, I will uh, soon resign. Uh, e. Brand uh, took a huge amount of criticism, never recovered from that, uh, but uh, became uh, uh, a prominent politician. 
Uh, and uh, Vandiver then was uh, uh, replaced uh, uh, by uh, 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 Sternbach. Uh, oh, okay, okay, all right. Uh, anyhow, Vandiver is typical of the kind of presidents we were getting until 1902. Uh, let's go to the uh, back, back again. Uh, in 1902, uh, April of 1902, that first building, this was the skeleton of that, the first building that was built for the college burned to the ground. Uh, and uh, I indicated by combustion internally, they tried to build it back. Uh, and uh, uh, Dearmont, the president at that time in 1902, uh, came up with a group of people on one evening just to walk them up and show them the work that was being done on the college. And uh, Vander had. Uh, 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 let people come up and take a look and so forth. But uh, the new president, uh, Washington Dearmont, uh, said to the group that came up that evening, uh, you can come up here. This is off limits at night. Uh, so you can come here. Uh, and uh, Mr. Dearmont said, sir, do you know who I am? Uh, and he sort of said, well, I don't care if you're the gas pajamas. You're not coming up here. I'm not letting you come up here. Uh, Dearmont said, I'm the president and I'm bringing you to show them the work that's being done. Uh, and uh, the night watchman suddenly doubled up his fist and slugged Dearmont in the jaw, broke his jaw, uh, and uh, then classified him for a number of years. But uh, Dearmont convinced him that you cannot that building. That building is just too damaged. Uh, and so uh, they had to pull every stop they could, every political maneuver they knew, they pulled uh, to get uh, R.B. Oliver, Robert Barrett Oliver, appointed to the Board of Regents uh, and elected to the House of Representatives, the State House of Representatives. So R.B. Oliver went into the legislature. Uh, and got enough money to build a brand new building. Not an ordinary building, not one like the one that was there, but a new building, a bigger building. In fact, they got so much money, they built the biggest public building in the state of Missouri. Uh, the new academic hall was replaced, was replaced the original. Uh, the new building was constructed in 19 four, five, and six for just under $200,000, 183 feet long, had a huge auditorium. Uh, it was the biggest public building in the state of Missouri. Uh, and uh, as it says there, it's still in use. It's still the building where the president has his office. I'll bet you there's not a college in the state of Missouri other than that one that has the president seated in the same building that it did in 1905. And he built this for just under $200,000. And it is a symbol of higher education uh, for the state of Missouri, certainly for Cape Girardeau, certainly for Southeast Missouri State University. This is the epitome of the uh, normal school movement. Uh, it's the epitome of the new college uh, in the Midwest. Uh, is really a pretty fantastic building. Uh, and uh, uh, it goes all the way back to 1905, and it built it for just under $200,000. Uh, but because the custodian, the night Washington, had slung the uh, Dearmont, uh, Washington Dearmont, president of Southeast Missouri State, from 1899 to 1921, he's the first real president of that normal school, which became Southeast Missouri State University. His son became the president of the Missouri Pacific Railroad uh, and uh, was quite a prominent uh, national politician. Washington Struther 
Dearmont, uh, real academic, uh, a genuine uh, uh, administrator, and the first professional administrator uh, that served here uh, at uh, Southeast Missouri State University from 1899 to 1921. Uh, all didn't stay well, however, because in 1921, uh, there was a uh, student riot. Uh, they shut down uh, the university in protest of Mr. Dearborn, probably been in office just a, bit, a little bit too long, uh, I think. Uh, but this is uh, Washington Strauss Dearborn, who brought Southeast Missouri out of normal status, made it a real university, and today it has about uh, 10,000 students. Uh, Okay, next uh, slide. Uh, all of the time that uh, all of these other presidents were serving, uh, we had uh, Lewis Houck on the Board of Regents, and he became the president of the Board of Regents, Southeast Missouri State University. And he was president of the Board of Regents for 36 years. And we had all these other single presidents, all of them with the uh, uh, empire in the uh, high side, uh, all of them with the uh, prosperity in their uh, view, are replaced by Lewis Howe, who is certainly uh, one of the leading entrepreneurs of, of Southeast Missouri ever, uh, and the head of the Board of Regents for 36 years. And for 36 years, Frank, you're fading out sometimes. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. This is Lewis Howe. He was a small railroad, though. You go about 100 miles from railroad track. Uh, uh, and he did not use the most Movers that he did to keep his brain running. And so, how becomes a very prominent individual? He married a woman named Mary Gibbony, and the Gibbony family was from Virginia and had lots of money. Uh, and so, Mr. How and Mrs. How moved north of Cape Girardeau, about six miles, on a side road, private road one mile off of the road, and they build a grand good home. And this is Elmwood, the estate of uh, Lewis Howe and his son, Gibbony Howe, uh, southwest of Cape Toronto. Uh, Lewis Howe married Howe's daughter, uh, and they controlled about 8,000 acres of land in southeast Missouri and southern Illinois. He became the most prominent individual uh, built a castle, uh, basically a copy of Dalhousie Capital, uh, Dalhousie Castle, which is just outside of uh, 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 Edinburgh. In, Frank, you're fading again. In Edinburgh and Scotland. Sorry about that. But Elmwood is still there, and it is for sale if you're interested in buying it. Uh, here is a modern view of it. Uh, uh, Mr. Hauk and his family still own it. Uh, and they built that in the early part of the 19th century. Uh, and uh, it's full of treasures. Uh, we had the, uh, I was asked by uh, the owners of the family to do an appraisal, bring some students and do an appraisal of all the property inside that house. And so we did, we went into the house, we photographed every single item. Uh, we had an appraiser there to value each item. Uh, and uh, the library alone had a million dollars, over a million dollars worth of books, uh, autographed, signed, uh, original copies. Uh, Elmwood's still there, it's been for sale, no one, has expressed a strong interest in buying it. Uh, but this is Howe's place. Uh, 
1904, uh, Hawks living in uh, that estate. And in Enable people to come to the fair in 1904. Uh, and one of the persons who went to the fair, all pumped up about it, was Lewis Howe. He wanted to buy some things uh, that he could uh, take back to him uh, and uh, promote him, his own in industry, uh, which was himself. Uh, and uh, uh, if you have, I know you've heard. About the World's Fair. Uh, he's the leading expert in the world. Uh, and, uh, Frank, maybe you need to get closer to the microphone. Okay. No, sorry. Sorry about that. Anyhow, this is the World's Fair, some scenes from the World's Fair, which is the greatest World's Fair ever. I think Mike would, think Mike would agree with that. And Lewis Howe spent three days there. He walked all around, he looked at everything, uh, and then uh, uh, here are some exa examples of the Palace of Fine Arts. Uh, uh, and uh, go to another slide. Uh, You're okay. Taylor's Army, we put up Okay, are you guys hearing real bad feedback? I'm not hearing feedback, but he's very weak. All right. Can you hear now? Now I hear a little bit of feedback, but he was okay. Okay, all right. Good. Okay. So here is uh, the World's Fair. Uh, Lewis Howe uh, from Cape Girardeau is at the World's Fair, walking around, and someone told him that at the end of the fair, most of the exhibitors were to sell their exhibit. Uh, and uh, uh, if he wanted to buy them, he could buy them. And he was especially taken with a set of uh, statues uh, from August Gerber. From so uh, uh, Gerber is a young man from Cologne uh, in the Munich area, uh, and uh, he was walking around and ran into this charming young man. Uh, uh, Hauk grew up in a German family. He never learned English until he was 21 years old. Uh, and so he and Gerber got along very well. Uh, and uh, uh, Hauk bought his collection of statuary uh, for uh, $1,888. Uh, uh, one thing I saw was uh, 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 about this uh, was that there were maybe 200 pieces of plaster of Paris statue at the World's Fair in 1904. There was a lot of it, and Gerber was not the only one selling uh, cast uh, like this. Uh, and uh, so uh, Hauk took all of that, shipped it by river down to Cape Girardeau, loaded it on a boat, or on a, uh, a wagon, uh, and uh, took it up to the uh, college and uh, set it up in the college in this situation. Uh, and uh, here is the scene that I remember well. Uh, this is down the main hallway of Academic Hall, biggest public building in the state. And that's uh, uh, Venus de Milo at the end of the hall. And for a period of time, I went uh, on a temporary contract. They didn't have work for me the third year well, they said, we'll put you to work in a business office. So I worked in the business office, which was just to the left of Venus de Milo. But every time I entered and left uh, that office, I saw Venus. Uh, and uh, I got there usually pretty early in the morning, about uh, uh, 7.45. Uh, 
And so Jack Webb, the treasurer, came to me one morning and said, Frank, you get here pretty early. Uh, there are people who put different things in uh, uh, Venus's hair. Uh, they sometimes dress her. Uh, and uh, we would like for you to come in in the morning and just be sure she is not dressed. Uh, and I said, well, I guess I could do that. Uh, and one morning we came in, she had on a pair of black uh, uh, panties uh, and black uh, 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 brassiere. Uh, I took them off of her. So here we were at this time in the 1960s, being sure that Venus de Milo did not have any clothes on. Uh, and uh, sometimes we found cigarettes glued into her mouth. Uh, found alcohol, we found all sorts of nuisance things. Uh, uh, and so that was my job. Uh, and I thought maybe I might have the most unusual job uh, in America uh, or any college student. And uh, uh, that would have, been, would have been in 1972, I believe. Um, but all of the statues of the World's Fair are lined down this hall. Uh, and it was really quite a show. Uh, it was a spectacle. Uh, and those sat in there until about 1975. And then they just had to move them because there wasn't enough room yeah, on the college uh, to hardly stand up. This is this hallway today. This is the main hallway. And through those double doors down there on the right is where uh, my office was and where I uh, checked on Venus every morning at about 7.45. Uh, uh, and uh, some of them are uh, now in uh, various places on the campus. They moved them all around the campus. And when they did that, they broke some, uh, they lost some. Uh, and so uh, I think there were about uh, maybe 70, 68, 70 uh, statues, uh, plaster of cast uh, statues. Uh, today, there are only about uh, uh, 40 some left. Uh, uh, this is where the statues are now. Here's the World's Fair statues, uh, the Hauk statues, we call them, or the Hauk, uh, the Hauk statuary. Uh, they are now in the former Baptist church. Uh, which was sold to the university because the Baptist Church became uh, uh, too big. Uh, it, it just outgrew uh, its congregation. And so they sold this to the university, and the university put all of the uh, uh, statuary into this. Uh, and it's uh, interesting because it's all enclosed. And I'll give you some view here now of, uh, here's the first Baptist church in this education building, and let's move on. Uh, here's an example, and here's a view of the inside, and all down this island, on this wall, which has size glass windows, and on the other wall are the standing statuaries, uh, the ones of Venus de Milo uh, and of uh, a uh, number of others you see here on the right side. Uh, the windows let in lots of white, uh, all kinds of activities and festivals here. Okay. Uh, better view of the windows and the statues. That's how they're portrayed. Up on the stage, and they put this up, uh, these are all of the busts. We have 11 busts here uh, of famous people, all made by Gerber. Here are examples. They include uh, uh, Michelangelo's work, uh, copied and reproductions, plaster of Paris, Pestilence, Praxiteles, Martin Luther, and you can, and uh, he's, I don't know who, who that is. Uh, uh, there are two von, two, uh, von Humboldt's. Uh, and this is uh, Diana Milo. Uh, here's an example, Cicero, by an unknown artist. 
Dancing Boys by Rabia, which I think is an especially fine freeze. They're freezes, uh, they're busts, and they're standing statues. So all together, there's approximately, it's just short of 100. And they're really remarkable. When you look at them up close, they are reproductions. And reproductions are coming back now. Uh, reproductions fade away and come back. Uh, reproductions are coming back into prominent uh, uh, publicity now. Here's the funeral feast of uh, uh, Socrates. Again. Some other friezes, there are several friezes. And these are all made by Gerber in 1904. So they are 130 years old. And you can see all of these uh, are absolutely stunning when you look at them up close. Here is St. George by Donatello. Go ahead. Artemis. Von Steinbeck. A large Herculaneum woman, Minerva. Okay. Copy. Bacchus. Venus de Milo. And she's the one that gets all of the attention. Everybody wants to paint her, uh, color her, dress her. Everybody wants to dress her. Uh, but she's in the, uh, what used to be the uh, uh, chapel of the church. It's now been turned into a museum. I think the man involved in doing that was Southeast President uh, Mark Scully. Kind of a new. Uh, uh, was the guy, uh, uh, the, the uh, president I mentioned a while ago? Oh, how He's probably, an, he's uh, partially a new how Very dictatorial, very right wing, very conservative. He was a non, he was a traditionalist in a non-traditional world. And uh, uh, he looked after the Venus de Milo. And he would come and check me and ask, any clothes on Venus? today and I said nope uh, I haven't seen it uh, if I did find some I didn't tell him because that would increase uh, uh, management all the way through anyhow uh, that's a quick run through and I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have do you have a question period here Mike Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Mike, I'm currently looking for questions. There's a few comments about the uh, microphone, but the last 10 or 15 minutes, I think the sound was better, Frank, for what that's worth. I have a couple of questions since I'm unmuted uh, to ask that uh, might interest other people. Frank, you said there were about 200 pieces that Gerber made. Did close to 200 of them get to SEMO? And if so, how many are still in existence today at SEMO, whether they're on display or storage? Frank, you're muted if you're saying anything. Muted. Did Frank catch that question? No, I hear you now. Can you repeat it? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, my question was, uh, Frank mentioned about 200 pieces that August Gerber made. Did most of them get to SEMO? And if so, does SEMO still have about that many or have some of them been lost through the decades? I have I, what I believe to be an authentic uh, record sheet uh, of how many pieces were delivered to SEMO. I count 68.
but we did not get all of the pieces that Gerber shipped. He shipped some uh, to uh, uh, other people. He sold some to other people beside uh, Howe. Uh, and uh, uh, after uh, Howe got home back to Cape Girardeau, he ordered a number of pieces of uh, statues uh, from uh, uh, Gerber. So he was still buying pieces after he returned to Cape Girardeau. So I don't know how many pieces were in the total package. Okay, uh, and kind of a follow-up to that. Um, are all of the large statues on display in the Alumni Center now? As far as we know, they are. And that's about uh, how many? Uh, there are eight. Okay. Four on each. No, there are nine. There are nine. And they all look to be larger than life size, if I had to guess, about eight or nine feet tall. That's true. Okay. So, folks, I'm sure there were some other questions. Uh, you know, uh, I found it fascinating. Uh, a lot of these are ancient Greek uh, figures from, you know, Greek uh, his history way, way back, ancient Greek. Uh, but some of them, the busts in particular, are of modern Germans, correct? Yes. Mike, I have a question in a chat room. Oh, go ahead. How did Mr. Gerber make the reproductions? And where did he get the casts of the originals? I don't have an answer to that. Mike probably has a, an answer to that. I do not. I find this uh, really pretty fascinating. And uh, I had, um, I've read uh, a couple of articles recently by Lauren DeSalvo, who did a master's thesis on the, the whole topic of uh, Hauk's uh, uh, statues. Uh, and uh, that article is being used widely in libraries by people who are interested in uh, plaster of Paris uh, uh, information. Uh, it's a hot item right now uh, among librarians. If you can see that screen, if you Google Lauren DeSalvo, D-I-S-A-L-V-O, and the first few words of her thesis, the aura of reproduction, plaster cast collections from the 1904 LPE, uh, you'll find her thesis without too much difficulty. I didn't find it until I was really kind of digging into Gerber's statue history. Uh, she's got 70 or 80 pages of details about the roughly 200 statues and casts, busts and friezes that he made. Unfortunately, her thesis back in 2011 was purged of all illustrations. And I finally tracked her down out in Utah and we got a few of the illustrations showing the statues at the fair just last week for this presentation. Oh, wow. Um, at any rate, uh, I had another follow on conversation with a potential future speaker, a local sculptor here in St. Louis, who said he was aware of all this. Uh, he came to our show and tell and talked about statuary and the sculpture presentation I did, et cetera. Um, but I asked him about these sculptures and casts, and he said, oh, from roughly the 1880s up till almost 1920, there were a number of people like August Gerber going around Europe making casts of various historic statues. And from that, those casts, they would then pour a reproduction uh, and, you know, have to break the cast to then get it out. Uh, I find that fascinating to make a mold of a famous statue without damaging it, especially if it's a... Uh, a porous stone 
that wouldn't damage the original statue at all, but it apparently became a uh, uh, an industry that some artists were able to do safely and uh, you know make these kinds of reproductions of fairly famous statues. And Frank, you might know. Uh, I'm not sure about the friezes, but I'd be willing to bet some of the busts and some of the statues uh, are in fact verified reproductions of a very famous statue you said uh one of them was by mike michelan or michelangelo yes. uh the venus de milo etc those are the same size full scale i guess of the statues that are in germany yes they are and germany of course has always been the center of uh, plaster of uh, uh you know cast uh for uh, reproduction uh, Germany has uh, always done that, and uh, they are still doing it. And I understand that in Germany now, uh, there's almost a, a rage of building a plaster cast uh, as reproductions. There are lots of people doing it. They're commanding very high prices. If you look on the internet, you'll see lots and lots of plaster uh, cast. Uh, and uh, statues for sale at very high prices. Uh, and I don't know who's buying all that stuff, but uh, somebody is, and somebody's making it, and mostly Germans, I think. There's another question in the chat room from Patricia. I saw the slide of busts in the German hall, but where were the life-size statues placed around the fair? I think they were, my knowledge is that they were in the Palace of Liberal Arts. Yeah. I, I think that, uh, Frank, I'll jump in here. I think Lauren DeSalvo's uh, thesis, and I didn't, I've read it over, but I didn't go into details. It talks about, you know, the busts were, I think, in the German ex exhibit in yes. either varied industries or in the german pavilion i'm not sure which the okay. statues i think were mostly in liberal arts but some were displayed in other places uh where germany had some quote real estate yeah uh, liberal arts primarily but uh the fact that they were reproduction statues and i'm just guessing here meant that they didn't merit perhaps top exhibit space in the uh palace of fine art ah okay uh, i'm just guessing and you'll notice like that statue right there some of the statues were in fact painted a bronze color after they had been cast but they are still cast you know reproductions right and there were and a lot of them painted to look more like a bronze sculpture yes, yes. There's one that's bronze in the middle. It's kind of hard to see there. Yes. Yes. Yep. We see your mouse moving around. Yes. Along with some other white ones. Yeah. Is that the Venus de Milo on the left there? Yes. I took care of her. I watched out for her for at least two years. And I thought, my goodness, I bet nobody else in a college enrolled in America has a job like this. So Frank, if somebody put, uh, to use a old uh, song lyric, if someone put some flowers in her hair or something, how did you get up on the pedestal and then nine feet high above the pedestal to get the flowers off? <laughs> we had a step ladder that I had to use and I kept it in my office. And I <laughs> run off with it. Because was uh, in a college, uh, building, you have to watch uh, for everybody stealing your stuff, and and uh, uh, everybody would take that ladder, and so I had had to lock it up in a closet, and uh, I cut, I'd go and get that out in the morning. I'd check and see if there was a cigarette in her mouth, or uh, if she had if she had been dressed during the night, which is kind of an interesting thing. I had a 
I told I went home and told my wife uh, what I was doing, and she said, "You what?" <laughs> so it's an it was an interesting phase of my life, and I did it for about I guess I was the bursar for uh, almost four years, and so the bursar got everything that no one else wanted to do, uh, and uh, one of them was. Uh, Get things out of uh, Venus's hair, and uh, people <laughs> would put all kinds of things in her hair. There's a little kind of a little flat area at one time, uh, and uh, we got several condoms uh, out of uh, Venus's hair. <laughs> and on one occasion, we got a used condom. No. Oh. Uh, and uh, when I told Mr. Wimp that, uh, Mr. Wimp was an extremely conservative, traditional person. Uh, and so he and I are doing something that uh, he has not much interest in attending to. Uh, but we always have fun doing it. I have one more question, but I'd like to see if uh, anybody else in the audience has any questions to uh, unmute yourself and just uh, speak up. I'll give you a few seconds here. Frank, one other question uh, in one of our conversations, maybe a long while ago before uh, your accident and injury, uh, that... Uh, we had talked about some of the statues that kind of got scattered to the winds in different places for sometimes five, 10 years into dormitories or whatever. Yes. And I guess it was, uh, what, around 2000 or so when the university decided to try to collect them all and found most of them, I hope. But uh, yes. do you have any stories about where they ended up and, uh, you know, some of the, any odd stories from that? Uh, we have. Um... Uh, we had a number of statues uh, that spent some time in a building called Memorial Hall. Uh, and uh, uh, Memorial Hall has been probably the most uh, uh, refurbished building in the whole, on the whole campus. Uh, and uh, all of these, uh, many of these statues were moved in there. I think they were all in there at one time. Uh, and there, there you would see on the campus, uh, you would see these uh, trucks moving around with these statues in the back of them all the time. And I know oh, what in the world are they doing now? Uh, they were in several buildings at some time or other. Uh, and they had an idea at one time that they would scatter them all across campus and let everybody have a chance to see them, uh, which doesn't work on a college campus. Uh, and uh, uh, we had uh, uh, one fraternity that stole one of the statues and took it from a university building and put it in their fraternity house. Uh, happened to be a female. Uh, and I can't imagine what all was done to that statue. Uh, over in that fraternity house. August Gerber would probably be shocked to realize what had happened to his uh, work. Uh, I, I remember that that was done, and it may have happened to others. Uh, I think it's re remarkable that as many have survived as have. We've never had anybody who understood art, uh, who understood uh, uh, ancient history uh, on that campus who have ever dealt with those statues. Uh, they're just sitting there. They've just recently been moved into a different location in this uh, chapel of the old church. Uh, and uh, the, there are four people who work in that building full time. Uh, none of them have any art background. None of them know anything about those statues. None of them know much about history, I assume. Uh, and so they don't know what these statues are. And so they can't appreciate them because they don't know them. 
And uh, I think that's really been a loss. Uh, no one has benefited from them the way they could be. I go in there every once in a while just to check out uh, if there's any damage. I go in there and it's, if there's no one in there, it's quiet, it's like a church, and you walk around among those statues and you enjoy their image, you enjoy their perspective. Uh, and it's really remarkable. I find them beautiful. Uh, I find them uh, uh, peaceful. Uh, I find them bringing a uh, uh, kind of feeling about you when you're surrounded by all of those statues. And all of that, uh, those uh, books up on the, the uh, stage. Uh, when you just look at uh, the humbugs, you look at Martin Luther. Those are gripping images. And Bruder was a really fine uh, artist. Uh, oh, you're getting a little weak again, Nick or Frank. Pardon? You're getting a little weak there. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I'm leaning back. But anyhow, I like them. I like to walk among them. I like to look at them. Uh, I find them uh, kind of reassuring uh, that they're still there. But they have been there. Uh, I've been on the campus now uh, approaching 50 years, I guess. Uh, and they're still there. And they look the same. They look the same. And I find... Uh, uh, the image that the artist wanted to present reflects in my mind. I look at Cicero, and I see I, I see uh, uh, Martin Luther. And I think about those people in our time, kind of uh, almost modern times, uh, as uh, uh, still there. There's something about them that has a presence. That I like, and I find reassuring. I think artists can do that. And Gerber did that. He was not a great salesman, but he was a good artist. I think one last question just popped in my mind, Frank, when you talked about things being moved around. I would imagine these busts being done in stone would have weighed several hundred pounds and an eight or nine foot statue i can't even begin to imagine in stone what it might have weighed and i was wondering whatever these are made from the magic resin mixture or whatever that was you know put into a mold to replicate the original is it as heavy as the original or is it a lighter weight material or I do think you know it's a little lighter i uh, never picked one up, uh, but I did tilt them just to see, to get a feel of how heavy they were. Now, I love this Rich Andrew von Humboldt. Uh, I think that is a superb bus. And Diana hate bad. <laughs> no. Well, last call for questions from every, anybody? Mike, I have a couple in the chat room. Oh, please go ahead. Do you think any of these busts or statues made it into private collections? I I think that Gerber went to the World's Fair and sold a lot of stuff. I don't know how much stuff he took, but he sold a lot of stuff. He sold a lot of material. And someone says, uh, uh, I saw some of them or something. He never brought over 200 pieces to the World's Fair. He never took any home. We sold them home. So there's 200 were sold to somebody in St. Louis. And we have about, uh, we probably had about 70 some total. We didn't lose as many as you might guess on a college campus. Not protected. And not watched. Somebody putting condoms on the head of a woman. What else might they do? And so I think that uh, uh, 
I think we're fortunate that we had this much left. The other question was, uh, could, and this is from Tony Grimes, could he speak to lighting fixtures and academic hall that came from the 1904 World's Fair? I heard some came from the fair. P.S. I graduated from SEMO. Questions about the lights? Yeah, the lights uh, down the hallway of academic hall. are from the World's Fair, right there. This was, uh, this uh, academic hall was uh, just uh, uh, refurbished uh, about what, two years ago now, maybe. Uh, oh, it, there it is right there, uh, 2013, for $23 million. That tile is from the World's Fair. And the light fixtures are from the World's Fair. We had a president at one time, lo and behold, who said that if we renovate a building, we should maintain as much of the historical items as possible. Uh, he was uh, one of the really good, one of the few really good administrators we had. And he said that we should maintain as much of the old stuff as we can. And the tile on the floor is always polished, it's always shiny, uh, it's always pretty, and the light fixtures are always pretty. And I like that. Uh, and then one other person said, Diane said, the brass security rails were report reportedly from the fair, too. Ah, I did not know that. Uh, that could be. They're fancy and they're shiny. I suspect most society members know, but you may not know down in uh, uh, Cape that Diane Rodemaker, who submitted that last comment, wrote a book back in uh, the 2000 time frame. I think Diane published it in 2002 or three, just before the centennial. And she noted not only the Gerber statues, but probably about 60 or 70 other things, whether they're structures, buildings, chandeliers, uh, a ginkgo tree, etc., that had their beginnings at the World's Fair, but could still be seen today when she wrote that uh, book. Wow. Um, wow. Um, I know she doesn't take any... Uh, uh, rumors or someone said there, whatever, but the Gerber statues definitely were. And uh, uh, I know you didn't have as much information back in 2001, Diane, if you're still online, uh, you know, about these statues. Uh, but, uh, you know, down to the brass railings and stuff like that. I think that's remarkable. The book is called Still Shining. Uh, and if you look up Still Shining and her first name, Diane, on Amazon, you'll probably find it. And you can get yourself a copy pretty easy. I will get one immediately. Um, I have one last uh, thought for uh, the people at SEMO. Uh, maybe building on Lauren DeSalva's thesis it would be kind of neat for someone, maybe an, another master's report or thesis, to re-inventory the casts that you have, find out what the originals were, where the originals are located now that SEMO has the cast statues, and write about the sculptor, if the sculptor of the original is known, and kind of link the 1904 casts to the past and their history in uh, more detail. That's a great idea, and I appreciate that. Somebody in the art department might be able to run with it or something. I don't know. Anything else in the chat room or uh, from anybody else? Nothing else in the chat room. 
Well, I want everyone to kind of raise your hands, uh, you know, and you, you can stop the screen sharing at this point, uh, Denise. And, uh, you know, since uh, most of the people are muted, we can't give Frank a round of applause and Denise and Tom for all their help. But for those of you who have your cameras on, let's all wave our hands. <laughs> And I see some people are raising their hands. I see little yellow hands on a lot of the uh, uh, things. So that's kind of good too. Really interesting, good presentation and something that I didn't know a lot about until uh, we started talking earlier this year, Frank. So uh, uh, really enjoyed you taking the time during your recovery and to Denise and Tom for their help uh, in putting this together. Denise has just been superb. And Tom. Uh, we, we had a couple of challenges as we were trying to establish connectivity and then something happened to her microphone and had to reboot her computer and uh that was yesterday i think when we did that but uh we fought through all that and uh uh you know it was uh all very good and i think we all enjoyed it so i will be sending a token of our appreciation down to you frank uh you know for you and uh the group to share or whatever and uh keeping your archives is a memento of this we're going to take uh, tom and uh, denise uh, out for um, you know some time. it's been fun everybody okay well i got a couple of uh uh final updates about upcoming society events and meetings and stuff like that uh, the last couple months have been very busy. I did an outreach, pre outreach presentation last week at a church, uh, got a uh, honorarium for the society. Uh, keep an eye on the society bullet bulletin and uh, the board will be getting some more information about uh, uh, the vacant position and uh, upcoming meetings. But of course, uh, Saturday, December 3rd at 1230 is our annual closing day observance banquet. Uh, of course, we're having it a couple days after closing day, which was December 1st at the golf course. Like I said, you've got the reservation form. And if you don't give me a call and I or an email and I can send it to you and it's not too late to sign up. Uh, if you aren't a member, please contact me and we can take care of that as well as making uh, a banquet reservation for you. And it'll be good fellowship, a great buffet meal with uh, chicken and uh, beef, as I said gifts and surprises and entertainment. And here's a peek at our first couple of January meetings uh, that will probably be in the next issue of the bulletin. Wednesday, January 11th at 6 p.m. Uh, we'll have a meeting at Booter Library on Hampton. Uh, Jason Stratman from the History Museum will give us a presentation called A Visit to the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair. And he will... Uh, feature stories and information from some of the many diaries that the History Museum has in their collection. Also, uh, in February, and this is, uh, you know, uh, still being set up, but we have February 11th as a primary date and a week later, that's a Saturday, a week later is a backup in case there's bad weather, as January and February kind of noted for. Uh, will be having a presentation or a visit to the St. Louis Central Library and the St. Louis Public Library Special Collection. It's been about a decade since we went down there to see all the St. Louis books they have and to tour uh, the building, which is a very historic building uh, designed by a famous architect who uh, had something to do with the fair in that he designed Festival Hall and uh, I think the Art Museum too. So. That'll be coming up. I also want to, uh, I guess, pass the microphone off to Dan. This, well, no, I'm not going to do that now, Dan. You're coming to the banquet, aren't you? I hope to, but I have dual events again. Uh, the cemetery has scheduled a uh, Christmas or holiday program through that, so I'm seeing if I can get a backup or not. Okay, well, I sure hope you can because uh, I can't tell you how much I've appreciated your work over the past nine years. Uh, not only keeping our money straight and doing what we need to to you know stay out of trouble with the state and feds and stuff like that but also having great contributions to the society of uh, uh i think uh, one of the great things you did uh, about five years ago was when maybe in st louis came you totally took control of that and 
we had about 60 people show up and you took the money in, you bought everybody a t-shirt. We had a little snack. We got the tour. We had dinner. Uh, it was just really great. So for all that, uh, I want to give you another big giant wave. <laughs> I forgot about the night that I slept in Forest Park. Oh, yes. The FARE for the first few years, uh, setting the tents up and uh, zipping up to tents. And you decided, I think, after doing that one year that, uh, nope, never again. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, the night, or that was the time that we were at Shakespeare's Glen. Right. Lots of interesting creatures in Forest Park at the night. No, uh, I don't know if I want to know about that. <laughs> Do they howl or what? Mm, they, they make lots of noises. Oh, well, speaking of interesting creatures. <laughs> um, come on, get down. Uh, I think that's about it. I just want to... Uh, Say once again to our friends down at SEMO, thank you for putting together a wonderful presentation and sharing that with us. And, uh, you know, I look forward to making a trip down there sometime. Maybe we'll bring a busload of people uh, next summer to uh, come and actually see the statues. Um, last call for anybody with inputs about either meetings or upcoming uh, events or anything about the uh, fair besides the banquet. Okay, I want to thank everyone for uh, coming and tuning in and giving us uh, an hour and a, half for, and a half of your time. And I hope you uh, enjoyed the presentation about the uh, August Gerber cast statues that were brought to SEMO by Lewis Hauk. Thanks and hope to see all of you at the banquet. Bye. <laughs>